going, going. <laughs> and we are live. All right. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we are delighted to have our good friend PJ Tracy here with us. She's going to be talking about her brand new book, The Devil You Know. And uh, as always, uh, Tracy has signed a batch of books for us. If I could find the title page. Um, yeah, there we go. So I will go. We have a you know, a number of signed copies left, and I'll go ahead and put a link uh, in the comments field if you'd like to order one. Uh, and if you have questions for Tracy, please go ahead and put them in, and Barbara will bring me back on screen towards the end of the hour. So, Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. I hope the sun, Patrick, is the westerly sun's shining in. <laughs> so I know. It's, yeah. our new, it's our new Zoom studio upstairs, but we obviously have a little tinkering to do with it. <laughs> PJ tells me that um, that we should be glad for it because she's in Minnesota in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> so you move you move back from Los Angeles. You were there for a while, but now you're back home in Minnesota. I am. Yeah, I was in LA for ten years, and you know I think they always say people from the Midwest always go back home ultimately. So it's good to be back. I had a wonderful time there, but there's a time and a place for everything, right? Yes, there is indeed. So for those of you who have a long history with the poison pen, we first met PJ when she and her mother, now sadly deceased, her wonderful mother, whom we loved, um, wrote the Monkey Wrench Gang series. Um, Monkey Wrench is still one of the most electrifying debuts I can remember. And they wrote them together. And now PJ has um, writing on her own uh, with all the same style and verb and wit that she had before and instead of series in los angeles that began with deep into the dark and desolation canyon both of which we did zoom events for and both of which she signed for us so in fact the devil you know is book three wow you can read it as a standalone but you know pj i was looking at various reviews it's always interesting to me to see what other people have to say most of them agree that this might work better if you had read the first two books. Do you think that's oh, true? I, you know, I always feel that way about a series because you're missing so much backstory and character development. I mean, and, you know, you always try when you're writing a series, try to make sure it's staying alone. It can be, but um, there's just, there's so much you miss. You know, there's so much depth that happens, occurs as you're arcing everyone especially when you get to a book number three lots happen it has a lot been a lot so the plot it's not that you can't read it as a standalone the plot is all there and if you happen to pick up this one as your first reading experience you can go back and get the other two which are both out in paperback and yes. both large paperbacks not the small ones and we have them both at the store. But anyway, um, tell us a bit about this new main character, because with the Monkey Wrench Gang, you actually had multiple main characters, multiple narrators and stories to tell. But this one's a little more focused. Yeah, uh, it is a little bit more. And by the way, as an aside, Barbara, I don't know if you know this, but Monkey Wrench, the first novel, is 20 years old this year. Wow. You know, I could have counted. I apologize. I should have done that. No, no, no. Gosh, has it really been 20 years since we 20 met? years was published in March 2003. Wow. You know, there's uh, a picture of you and your mom in the store and it's it hangs in such a way that when I'm doing other author events, I can see it. And oh. I, I often think about the two of you together, but now I realize that that photo is 20 years old, which is a little frightening. I, it is a little scary. Well, we always love, we loved <laughs> spending time with you with Poison Pen. We had so much fun. But um, yeah, this book, I mean, this series, it, it primarily focuses on two people. First of all, the LAPD detective, Margaret Nolan. And um, she is in the um, homicide special section, which is very elite and it's very much an old boys club. And so she's, you know, she's strong, she's confident, she's compassionate, but she's still fighting to find her place there. And um, so she's a really fascinating character um, to write because um, she just, she takes things personally. I mean, every homicide, every bad thing that happens and um, she's not tormented by them, but it affects her deeply. And I think that makes her a much more effective 
an empathetic homicide detectives. So that's always, um, she's a great character to write and kind of her counterpoint a little bit of Sam Easton, who is an Afghan war vet who is suffering from a severe PTSD and he's battling his own demons, his own struggles. And in the first book, Deep Into the Dark, um, they become connected when he's a murder suspect and their relationship is progressing and developing um, through each book, which is a reason why you maybe want to start with Deep Into the Dark, because there are a lot of interpersonal things that are going on between these characters that, you know, you miss out, including her new love interest, who is also a homicide detective. Yes, well, um, you know, cops lead such difficult lives. We all know that the marriage, the divorce rate, let me say, for cops is tremendous. And, um, you know, maybe they really do have to sort of like pair up with each other or somebody well, in a similar kind of maybe an EMT or something like that. But people who understand exactly. that kind of job with its ridiculous hours and its constant demands and overtime and all the rest of it, it's hard for a person who wants a more settled life to exactly. have any kind of relationship with somebody in the police force. Yeah, the, you have to have somebody with a shared experience because there is so much tragedy and desolation in their jobs. And, I, you know, if you don't, if you're not going to crime scenes where there are tragic homicides, I don't think you ever really understand what that's like, that, that element of human tragedy that they see, you know, sometimes every day. And they live with it, you know, cases can drag on for years. So they're just so fully immersed. And I think that's um, often why you see people in these these fields, they always have um, graveyard humor, because I think there needs to be a safety valve, because if you're serious all the time and, you know, you can't find humor, you probably go insane. So what what drew you as a monkey wrench for cops to what what draws you to writing about police persons as opposed to anything else? Well, I think it was always PJ and I always love to solve mysteries and the greatest mysteries are always crimes. So um, it was a genre we loved and had always read. But I think, you know, life, life is kind of one giant puzzle. You're always trying to figure things out and the cops are doing it on a different level. And it's just it's challenging and stimulating to solve these puzzles. And um, they're wonderful characters. You know, we've had a lot of law enforcement, FBI, um, computer people in our lives helping us throughout this journey. And they're such wonderful, fascinating, you know, brave and admirable people. And, you know, we just love them. So, you know, we kind of wanted to give them a, you know, a shout out in a way. But, you know, it's just, I think that if you're having fun writing, you're going to write something good. Well, living in Los Angeles for 10 years, let you make that transition from a Minnesota-based group to um, an L.A. group. I think um, I read in something that said that people who read Robert Kreis, for example, would really enjoy your books. Although, personally, I think they're quite different. But nonetheless, yeah. they're not really they're not really Harry Bosch Los Angeles books. But, you know, there's it's a big city with a very complicated um, social fabric and very complicated police department, which is actually not controversial, too, I should say. In right. Real, very controversial in real life. So, and currently probably really undergoing some pretty drastic everyday pressures because of the storms and the general mess that California is enduring right now. What an, what an awful thing to oh, be see through. It's just terrible. And, you know, people, I think, always, not always, but, you know, people will kind of think of L.A. as one thing or the other. And they associate it only with a big city or only with the gritty underbelly or only with celebrities. But Los Angeles has incredibly long, long, intricate history going back hundreds of years and it's fascinating and it's so much more diverse you know it's, it's this really intricately woven tapestry of um you know societal issues i mean just the whole gamut and you know it's fun speaking with people who are natives you know their family's been there for 100 200 years 
and just learning about all the things that you know I never knew about. You know, it's it's, it's an interesting place, and I think it gets a bad rap sometimes. Well, you know, it's always been interesting to me um, what people often write about a place they're not living in. Maybe they were there before, but you know, you lived there for ten years and you were really absorbed in it. But now, yeah. for Minnesota, you have a different lens. And I think that's good. But at the same time, are you going to find a way to sort of return and keep up with things? Because it changes so fast. If you're not there, will things move on and you won't catch them? That, well, I, you know, I would imagine that, you know, that that's always a risk. But, you know, being so firmly entrenched and, and filled with the um, observations and insights again, there's some things you know, the external factors, of course, are always going to be ever shifting. But um, I think the the zeitgeist of the place and um, just um, in ju the mindsets, you know, in these different groups is is somewhat stable, you know, in in that, you know, whatever is happening on the outside, it's going to affect them. But the, that inner foundational aspect of the personality of the city and the characters, you know, is not going to, you know, collapse. So. Well, you're in a good place to write this series. So, yay. I yeah. read something that called it an engaging Hollywood suspense procedural, which I don't think really sums it up all that well. For one thing, this is a pretty hard hitting you know, I don't know if that engaging is exactly the word. It is engaging, but um, that somehow seems to me to have a lighter tone uh, or it, connotation than I think this series has. It's really pretty dark. It is. It is pretty dark. And I mean, there is still the the humor and the quirky characters of the, you know, Margaret Nolan and, you know, the main characters. Um, but it is darker. But LA is a much darker place and darker things happen there. And, and that, you know, distinguishes it from Minneapolis. I mean, every, every big city has got issues, but um, LA definitely has a, a darkness to it. And I kind of, you know, I wanted to capture that. I think, you know, people are thinking, oh my gosh, you know, she's going so dark, but it's, I like to think of it as more of an intensity and a different direction, you know, and you can't write the same thing forever. You know, we're ever evolving as humans and learning things. And, you know, you have to spread your wings and branch out and just yeah. do what you feel. Crime fiction has always had a, an interesting nexus with Hollywood. You know, there's always a fascination with Hollywood history, Hollywood characters, Hollywood corruption, Hollywood yeah. things, you know, whether you're James Elroy or whatever. Um, and in this book, I think, you know, you really dish up a lot of Hollywood. Um, and let's talk about the prominent actor, Evan Hobbs, because oh, every yes. book needs both a victim and a villain. Yes, and, and I think there are a lot of both. And there some people are victims and villains. And I always, you know, I think of this book as being like a really wicked confection of Hollywood power and privilege and scandal. And, you know, something that might satisfy even the most discerning connoisseur of Schadenfreude. Um, but Evan Hobbs is a beloved actor. And um, he is found in the rubble of a Malibu rock slide a day after his career and his life was ruined by D-Pig video, where he is portrayed um, in a compromising situation with a minor. And uh, when Nolan arrives at the scene, she has, she has no idea whether it's a suicide or an accident or a homicide. And... Um, the investigation gets murkier when she receives a coroner's report and when she begins interviewing Hobbs's luminaries, um, you know, his friends and his colleagues. And all the while, Hobbs' agents is in full on damage control mode, dealing with a psychotic boss and a woman he scorned and his, his new super famous girlfriend. And all the lives of these powerful players kind of braid together as the story unfolds in very shocking ways. And as I was writing it, some of it shocked me too. <laughs> there you are. Always 
So we know at the beginning that two bodies are going to be found at some point in the plot. Um, so, you know, at it's, least. It, yeah, it's a murder mystery. So right. this can't be any surprise. But, you know, it's not always the way it seems. So anyway, we have Evan. He's found dead after the fake video. Uh, and it's after a party given by a Disney executive called David Baum and his wife, Essie. So were you okay actually using Disney? I mean, does that create any problems at all? By no. You know, no, I just, you know, I mean, Disney is a huge company and the names are not real. And, um, you know, a, a Disney, a, you know, it's not like I impugn Disney, the company or, you know. Yeah, yeah so I just, I I just thought, could, oh, go ahead. I just thought it was interesting. I mean, I know over the years I've talked to authors who, you know, don't want to name a, a, a restaurant, for example, or don't want to kill somebody in a restaurant everybody knows because, right. you know, um, and so, you know, you obviously can call it Disney or you could make up, you know, some giant Hollywood studio, but right. um, I didn't think there was any liability attached to it. I was just kind of curious. Like, well, I, I knew I, I did, Barbara, I did think about that as I wrote it, because I want, you know, Evan Hobbs is so wholesome, the actor, you know, character, and he was a, a young, you know, as a child starring Disney films and stayed with the studio the whole time. So I sort of wanted the reader to make that association. And I also, I thought, oh, can I do this? And, but I knew that my editor would set me straight if that was not kosher. So I guess it's okay. <laughs> No, it's fine. And, and you're right. Um, it does underscore the, you know, and it makes it even more apparent why a video that shows him to perhaps be a pedophile would be lethal if you were a Disney child actor or, or a Disney actor, because, you know, they do rely on the on the wholesome part. So absolutely. And it'd be like, you know, some woman on the Hallmark channel turning out to be, you know, <laughs> right. It, it wouldn't work out well. So anyway, there he is. Now, his connection to David and his wife, Essie, is what? Because that's really part of the plot. Oh, yes. Well, um, his agent, Seth Lehman, is Essie's brother. So David Baum is Seth's brother-in-law. And Evan Haas um, started with Dizzy when he was very young and he had no family. And the Baum family took him under his wings. And they truly, um, they made him, they made him a star. And so there's, you know, this interlinkage very tight with this, the, the family, with the Baums, the studio executives, Disney, Evan, and Seth Lehman, the brother. So it's all very incestuous in a way, but they do have a very long history, which makes things even more complicated, you know, as the plot moves on. Well, and she's also linked to a woman named Rebecca Woodhouse. So yes, <laughs> who's Rebecca? I mean, she's a wonderful Hollywood sort of character. And you didn't mention in the stew of things that goes on in this, that ambition is one of the really key um, personality traits, ambition being driven anyway, and ambitious people. It's hard to make it in Hollywood if you're not really... Ambition. Oh, exactly. I mean, and she is just a brutal and vicious and rapacious. And I mean, there's nothing she won't do. And I mean, there's absolutely nothing that means anything to her but money and power. And, um, and yes, I mean, it's, it's a very tough world out there. And people are like that. It is like, it's, it's all about them getting higher up on the ladder. Yeah, no, truly. And she's one of those kind of imperious people. She reminds me to some degree of the lawyer in Bosch, you know, the Maggie oh. or whatever. Is oh, name? yeah. Right. Um, although she softens in the sequel, you know, she's she's shot in the series and other things happen. And so she's not. But in the early Bosch, you know, she's you would never want to cross her. I mean, she is a really. Um, yeah tough and you know and and somewhat without morals well quite yeah you know, i mean her ethics can bend some and she's certainly ruthless i mean ruthless yes. is a great quality so 
you know, in an age when we're all talking about women having agency, I wonder, you know, if we sometimes reflect that maybe some women have too much agency. <laughs> I know it. But, you know, Barbara, it's just, you know, a characters like that are sort of like candy. You know, they're so fun to write. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, and it seemed totally appropriate for dealing with the, the film industry, you know, very much so. So, you know, yeah, was... well, larger than life characters. And, you know, one of the things that's always surprising is when you meet some, you know, Hollywood star or something in person, they are so much less most of the time than you expect. I've had that experience. I'll never forget going to a after premiere party in New York and Johnny Depp showed up. And oh. you know, I would have, I would probably have had him arrested as a bum off the street. If I had <laughs> known he was Johnny Depp, you know, I mean, he had a holy t-shirt and he was just, you know, I mean, you would, you would, you wouldn't invite him to a party if you were a real, you know, regular person. Which exactly. is just one example. And many, many years ago, I remember um, it was in our little store when I was probably the only employee or one of the very few employees anyway. And I remember sitting behind the checkout desk and I had my head down and all of a sudden over me, I heard this voice talking to somebody else. And I thought that can't, and I looked up and it was Robert Mitchum. He had oh, this- Oh, you're voice. kidding! No, because he, he spent time in Scottsdale, but I mean, he had that particular voice. And yeah, when I looked at him, he didn't, you know, his physically, he wasn't nearly as remarkable or impressive as his voice, which, you know, we were all used to. And and great actors usually have a really distinctive voice. I mean, that's a big part of them. And, um, you know, James Earl Jones, for example, we did an oh. event years and years ago, and I had a, a young employee, and I can remember um, hearing her scream, and I looked up and I saw money flying through the air because she had a cash box, and James Earl Jones had come up to buy something for her. And she, and she had her head down, but when she heard the voice, you know, she went like this. And so, you know, but but very often if you pass them in the street, you know, and you can't hear them, and and they're not all, you know, in makeup and fancy clothes, huh? you wouldn't even notice a lot of them. Oh, I know. And they're always so much smaller than you yes. think. You know, they're very imposing on the screen, but, you know, they're not exactly tall people they're not big people i mean obviously they're exceptions but it is um you know pretty extraordinary because you know in in 10 years and i was entrenched in the film industry out there and it's just it's always a surprise so evan if it, anyway let's skip over evan and go to david david is killed and so is kira tanner an aspiring actress and she is in possession of a thumb drive. Now, you know, right there, this isn't a spy novel, but it would be the same thing. If there is a thumb drive in the picture, there is some kind of uh, data that <laughs> one person has that, that other people want and somebody who's determined that no one else will see it. I mean, it's a, you know, I love it. So, it's a, well, you know, you so there are times when it is just so juicy and fun to throw in that foreshadowing or, you know, a telegraphic scene, because then, you know, I think it, I mean, even as I'm writing it, it's building anticipation because literally when I put that thumb drive in the first scene, I wasn't entirely sure what would be on it. <laughs> no, but if you didn't have it, you couldn't explore it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to like <clears throat> intersperse, you know, kind of leave these Easter eggs as you write, because I usually end up using all of them. But if I don't, I can just eliminate it because they can be very insignificant things that only become significant when the there's something important that's revealed about them later. So it's kind of fun. I mean, it's a, it's a game that I play with myself. It's also part of my writing process and always has been, you know, just doing that. Cause I, you know, I figure if I'm going to be surprised and I'm the writer, then the readers will. So tell us a little bit about your writing process since you brought it up. I usually ask that question later, but here we are. So how is it when you start this third book, you already know, two of your characters anyway, pretty yes. well by now. You know Margaret Nolan, the LAPD person. You know the PTSD guy. Mm -hmm. um, 
Do you know when you start out who the first victim will be? Because, I mean, you have to have, or what the first crime will be. It doesn't necessarily have to be a murder at the outset. No, it doesn't. You know, I, I generally know nothing in the beginning. And, you know, part of my process is I will have some ideas, um, some concepts about what's going to happen. Like, for instance, um, deep fake videos are very intriguing to me because they become so sophisticated and they truly can ruin lives. Yeah. And once, if you respect somebody and you see them doing something horrific, even if it's fake, that's always in the back of your mind, you know, even if there's zero veracity to it. So it really is incredibly damaging. So, um, you know, that would, that was definitely in my mind using the deep fake. Uh, I knew I wanted to go the Hollywood route and deal with the film industry and, and actors and agents. And, um, for Sam's um, part of the book plot um, that was based on an actual family letter that PJ and I found. And um, I think if I had read that letter, um, I don't know if Sam Easton would have existed as a character. So that's kind of the way that I write. And I have kind of have a general idea what's going to happen, a general concept and not, I don't want to spoil anything here, but I knew a lot of specifics in one aspect of the plot and one only, and everything else just comes as I go. I guess I'm a panster, as they call them, not a plotter. Well, um, if you're going to have a deep fake video, you also have to have, because there are some trouble and expense to make, you're going to yes. have to have, um, a motive for somebody doing that. It's exactly. possible that it's somebody being personally malicious. It's possible there's a revenge motive. It's possible there's an ambitious motive. If you can like take this character off the off the stage, you know, somebody else can walk on. And there's also the just did it for hire. So exactly. did you know when you when you decided to do the deep fake video, then you had to go to the next step, which is why did anybody do that? Right, exactly. And, you know, that that's part of the struggle of every book, because as you mentioned, um, you know, it's a great device because um, there are so many motives. And so I'm going through my head as, you know, I'm developing and thinking, you know, what is the motive going to be? You know, is it just, you know, malicious entirely or, you know, is there an old beef or something going on? And um the characters generally drive the refinement of the plot. So as I begin to add in new characters like Daft and Love, the famous actress, um, and connecting families and characters, that's sort of when, you know, I was able to pinpoint exactly, you know, what the motive was, who did it and why. But it really is a process. I mean, I, I honestly don't know a whole lot <laughs> what I meant at the beginning, but it just, it, you know, it's a progression that always makes sense to me. And the characters, you know, in large part, you know, drive the plot. You know, they have a lot to do with it. So. So if that's the way you're developing the story, you really need to populate it with a number of people who could be bad actors. Exactly. Um, do you, do you think that this particular group of people are mostly unlikely because, I mean, I'm sorry, mostly unlikable because, you know, if you haven't pinpointed the murderer, you have to strew the field with a number of potential murderers. Exactly. And I think, you know, that was, um, part, I mean, well, you know, from the Monkey Ryan series, I mean, we, PJ and I and me, you know, love not the characters are like the best, you know, they're so wonderful. And, you know, I could come up with a thousand more. I'd love to write characters. But yes, I mean, having the, uh, a majority of them being quite flawed, if not downright deplorable, really did open up the field for me. <laughs> Well, yeah, sure, because if you're working out how it's going to go, you need to have um, alternates. So and, you can go around and say, you know, Agatha Christie was really good at that. You know, um, Death on the Nile, for example. You yes. Know, you didn't really want to spend time with anyone on the boat. No. <laughs> right. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering if being a pantser means that you do need to have more despicable characters than if you were a plotter. I, I, like, like it. I think so, because the creativity and, and imagination that comes from being a pantser is, is so spontaneous. Yeah. And I really do think, you know, everything's been written before, right? I mean, as far as crime fiction. So, you know, you have to, you know, discern it from others. And part of, you know, part of that is keeping the reader guessing and not knowing who did it because there are some, you know, some novels we read and there's like only one person, maybe two, that could be the villain. And it's not so fun because, you know, the surprise is kind of ruined before you've even gotten into the book of the characters, you know? Right. No, so, I totally get it. You know, I mean, yeah. If, if, yeah. And it would be too predictable for the reader to really engage their interest because part of what drives you through the book is wondering what happened, you know, and why, and eventually who um, readers sort of like that. But I find also that crime readers really like learning stuff. So, you know, do you feel like you're sprinkling in, you know, learning moments about Hollywood as you're writing it along? Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, Hollywood, science, weird, esoteric things I know about. I mean, it's it's always fun because, I mean, I, I read because I want to become educated and know things. You know, it's always rewarding when you read something and it's like, wow, I learned something I didn't know about. And maybe you're more interested in, you know, research that further. And so, you know, I always try to do that. And, you know, of course, it always has to be experiential based on, you know, something that I do know about or people I do know about, or a city I, I know about. So that's, yeah, it's, I think it's part of um, the Easter egg thing. <laughs> you know, I have these Easter, little nuggets. It definitely is an Easter egg thing. So, I, you know, I thought that this line, um, I can't even remember which review it was that said, from the opening, readers will know two bodies are going to be found at some point in the plot. There's an implication there that the bodies we think are there may not be the bodies that we expect or the other way around. So, right. you know, do you, how much do you, you know, have to confirm at the outset that, um, how much do you have to confirm identity at the outset in, in any book? You know, what, what kind of sleight of hand is you, can you as an author indulge in without really annoying the reader? Well, th that's absolutely a fine line that you're always trying hard to, you know, find the balance in that because, um, yeah, we, we've all been annoyed because things get a little too crazy. And, you know, I am so grateful to my wonderful editors because they're always there to pick out things when you're too close to the forest to see the trees. But um, I think, you know, I think it's something that um, you learn to navigate after uh, through experience. I mean, you know, I've been writing for 25 years or almost 30 years. And it's something that you just get a sense of and a feel for. And of course, my voracious reader. And I think reading good books is as instructional as reading poorly crafted books because you see what doesn't work and you know what kind of pitfalls you want to avoid. So I think, you know, it's, it's just, you know, writing as a craft and you are always improving until the day you stop writing or the day you die, which is usually the same day <laughs> for writers, I think. And um, it's just, um, you know, you, you start to develop a second sense or an instinct for that. And then, you know, as I said, Wonderful editors will always reel you in if you've got a little too crazy. Well, right. Editors tend to, you know, want the whole plot to coalesce and make sense. Um, and so, you know, writing the characters, you can deepen them and so forth, but they have to be really your creation. But plot can be a collaborative thing, you know. Um, yeah. and, and when you're writing a book over a period of months, it's often, I think, you know, you can't always keep track of it in the same way that a person reading it in a day or so can see the whole picture. Um, I found yeah. that to be true as an editor, you know, very often that um, you, I could find unnecessary repetition, for example, or stuff that, or stuff that I knew got left out. And I remember I would say to my author, wherever it was, I'd say, you know, so 
what happened here? And they would tell me. And then I would say, but then why didn't you write it down? <laughs> why put <laughs> it in the book? And and it's because the, you know, the the writer knew it. But mm-hmm. it doesn't it doesn't help if you know it and it isn't in on the page. And that's yeah. the oh. few things I thought as editing were were always so interesting. What did you take out? And then what did you ask the writer to put in? And a lot of that is just a a, a the result of crafting a plot over a long period of time where these kinds of things develop, you know, it, and then it takes a new, fr- a fresh pair of eyes to read it all at once in a gulp and say, wait, you know, here's how this should go. I, and then that's why we're so grateful. Editors are the most wonderful people in the world. Cause yeah, seriously, if you take a year to write a novel, you are seeing it on a microscopic level. And it's one chapter at a time and it's one scene at a time. And you can have the last 350 pages in your mind, but you're so focused on what you're doing at that time. You know, you do forget, you make repetitions or you do forget to put things in. So yeah, fresh pair of eyes is like just, it's invaluable. I can't even express how invaluable it is to writers. I think so too. I think the editorial process is really a critical part of producing a good novel. But let's talk to wind up. Let's talk about your your narrators because you know when Monkey Wrench, you always had multiple narrators and yes. they had such different personalities, which meant they had very very different voices. So obviously, you learn to do that. You like doing that. Do you? I mean, I mean, I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you that for people who don't. You know. Do you have multiple narrators in the Margaret Nolan series? And how do you develop their voices if you do? Yes, I mean, there are multiple narrators in, in the series. And just developing their, their voices, actually, I did, the one thing that I really do think about hard and develop before I ever start writing, and sometimes I'll write vignettes to help me along, is I want to have a character solidly in my focus. I want to know everything about them. I want to know their history, I want to know what they're struggling with. And um, so that's that's found, building the foundation of the characters. And, um, you know, everybody has a different experience or a different struggle or a different joy. And automatically in your mind, you know, if you're a social person, meet a lot of people and talk and really listen to people, um, that abuse them automatically with their own voice. Well, you do a wonderful job of it. And Thank then, of you. course, you know, to the final cherry on the cake is you have to pull all of this together so you arrive at some kind of a coherent and reasonably satisfying <laughs> ending because no book really works if the end is not as good at the, as the beginning. That's it's absolutely good. right. Yeah, you have to. I mean, I always remember an editor saying, Stay strong to the finish. And that's really, you have to. And in fact, you have to accelerate at the finish. Well, it's not just that, but you know, you have to, you have to come up with a resolution that explains the, you know, you start out with a great idea or, you know, it's easy to have a really kick-ass thing that gets a plot going. But if you don't bring it to an end that, resolves it or you know leaves the reader feeling like the whole journey was worth it oh it all goes in i've read an awful lot of mysteries where the beginning was great and then it just didn't deliver in the end so do you find that you you know in the whole process is the end the thing that takes the most effort actually you know um i i feel that what takes the most effort is about halfway through because you've laid out all the plot lines and all the characters and you have all these loose threads and you have to do the braiding. But as you start pulling in one strand after another and the braid starts to form, it gets easier and easier and easier. You know, it's almost like having a punch list. It's like, okay, did this, now we have to figure out how it all, you know, weaves into a nice tapestry. And, um, so I always find that writing the end goes extremely fast. And at page 200, I always sit there and tear my hair out and go, what am I going to do next? <laughs> 
So it's just, I, I'm sure everyone's different in that way, but you know, once things are established and, and you start to figure right. it out, you know, those past. Well, you've had, you know, you've a lot of experience. You've written a lot of books and, you know, you, you know how it works for you. Um, right. I did notice that this book has an epilogue. So one thing we know in a series is that Margaret will survive. Or yes. this is the or this is a trilogy. I mean, either this <laughs> right. is a and we're there, or Margaret is going to make it through the book to go on and do another investigation, whether she stays with the LAPD or decides to go private or moves to Seattle, doesn't really matter. Um, but you know, the use of an epilogue can allow you to explore one more thing before the surprise conclusion. Um, yes. I'm not going to do any spoilers here. It also doesn't necessarily have to be the main character who winds up the, the book. So do you find an epilogue to be a really useful thing in a complicated plot? Oh, incredibly. I mean, it's totally valuable to me. And um, I have always loved reading epilogues because I always feel, and, and some people don't like prologues or epilogues, you know, I'm fully aware of it. We're all individuals, but I love them because you can really explore an aspect of the plot and a character that may have been, you know, roughed out or briefly explored and a plot point that is solved by the end, but there's an underlying motivation that's so much bigger. And because they're not one of the narrators, you can't explore that. So in that way, it's useful because, um, you know, if the person's not narrator and they're involved in something somehow, if you get into their head, you ruin everything. So there are characters you can't get into their heads and that blog's useful for that. Prologue is, can be useful for, you know, exploring a backstory that would be impossible or maybe tedious to um, write throughout the plot. So, you know, it, every book's different, every plot. But yeah, th this epilogue I thought was very important. Well, you know, it's the last word. It's the last word. It is word. the last <laughs> word. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it needs to be good. It, it just, you know, shouldn't shouldn't be flabby. And it should, as you say, it should wind up something that um, is important, but wasn't necessarily part of the main plot or from the main character. To sum up, this is a Hollywood mystery. We know that at least two people die from the very beginning. We know that Margaret <laughs> and all are going to yeah. chug through the case. We know that somebody has created a deep fake video and we need to find out why. And more than that, we probably shouldn't say because we will spoil it. But I will ask you, um, is there going to be a fourth Margaret? Well, I'm not entirely certain about that yet. So there okay. are th there are three different projects I'm kind of working on right now, and I probably won't say anything about it. One of them is a fourth Margaret Nolan. One of them is a finale to Monkey Wrench, and the other one is um, something entirely different that I've never done before. And so I'm just kind of waiting to see where that goes and, you know, what the publisher wants to do. And well, the so only important question is, are you writing something? You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be anything in particular, but right. I think fans always want to know that there'll be some new work from you, whatever. There's going to be some new work and there will be at least three more new works in the next three years. I can guarantee that. Excellent. Well, that's really good news. On that note, Patrick, come back if you're not blinded by the setting sun. <laughs> I wish I was. I, well, right. Oh, um, there's Patrick. It's completely different now. It's, it uh, is. The sun's yeah. gone down and it's good. nice and dark. But we need to do something about this light. It's really kind of antiseptic feeling. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm in a doctor's office or something. You need um, mood lighting, Patrick. I know. I know. You know I mean, we, lamps. Have, we still have work Green to do. This is a new space, and we haven't really had time to explore it. Oh, yeah. I have to come and see it. Yeah, definitely. So we got some good questions that have come in. Um, let's see. Robin would like to know, uh, do the different seasons in Minnesota versus California affect your writing schedule? <gasps> no. Actually, um, I write every day including every holiday. 
365 days a year because I just love it and I can't stop. And I can't stop thinking about it. So I'm always writing. And whether it's hot out or cold out, I mean, back in, in the monkey rent, when I was doing monkey rent, it was so funny because my publishing schedule was thus that I would do a spring, summer, fall, winter, you know. Right. Back. I remember. Yeah. Yes. And did that eight times, 10 times actually. And it would always end up that I was writing about a bitter, you know, sub zero, horrid, January and it was like July here <laughs> and, and vice versa I was writing you know and it was in so it really I thought it would affect it but it it really doesn't you know if you just do what you love you're so in your head you don't really care what's going on outside uh let's see um guy would like to know Hi, guys. To you, yeah you were talking earlier about um uh writing about kids or minors um yeah. how do you determine how far to go uh that's got to be tough to find a balance you uh, in my opinion on these really difficult topics you don't go far at all i mean there just almost has to be just an intimation because it, it's just so horrendous and so hideous and you know that's another very fun line but i you know I don't do gore. I don't do violence. You know, I mean, it's, it's not that kind of a series, but a good question guy. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Julie would like to know, will we ever see the monkey wrench characters again? Yes. Yes, you will. As I was just telling Barbara, um, I've got a lot of projects right now on my plate. And one of them is a monkey wrench finale because I just didn't feel like, I felt like they all deserved a, a final ending and closure and, you know, they're my dear friends and they have been for, you know, 20 years. So they need, they need an ending. They're a wonderful group. I mean, talk about eccentric. Wow. Yeah, no, they're, very, they're very fun. Right. Oh, that was one of the things that made them so fabulous was how different they all were, but how they all somehow managed to come together to resolve something. Yeah, I know. Never, it was never, their lives were never fully resolved, even if the plot was resolved. There was always, you know, a cliffhanger about what was going to happen to members of the gang, which made and, it and much fun. That's why I felt it, it's very important for me and for PJ's memory and for the fans of the series to right. you know, give them that satisfaction. Right. Uh, di well, on that note, Diane, Diane says, Tracy, thank you so much for your gift of writing. You bring your characters to life. And she says, I got hooked with the monkey wrench books during COVID. Oh, that's oh. nice. Yeah. Oh, nice. Thank you, Diane. How nice. Uh, let's see. Anything else coming in? Um, okay. Oh, well, Robin, uh, this is for you, Barbara. It says, Barbara, speaking of uh, years ago and seeing the book on your shelf, did you interview Jean Owl? I did. We, um, it was a conference. I can't remember who sponsored it. And it was at the Mesa Center for the Arts. And she was the main speaker. And um, we were the bookstore for that. And I had a chance to talk to her. She signed a whole bunch. This was, I think, I can't remember the title. I'd have to look behind me. But anyway, it was um, not one of her early works, but it was towards the end of her career. Um, and, you know, she was a real icon and inspiration to a lot of people. So it was a real pleasure to have a conversation with her. I um, love those books. I love them. Yeah. No, yeah, I mean, yeah, she was a, you know, pioneer in a particular sort of. Absolutely. I, I hate to say things like subgenre because that always, I don't know. I don't like labels like that, but <laughs> she was a pioneer in a particular kind of book that other yeah. people took up and you really had to respect that and you know she was pretty elderly I think um at the time that we did this but you were there Patrick you know I, I don't think I worked that one I, I was working I was working here at the time but maybe you were at the bookstore I bet it was yeah. a long time ago and part of the reason I remember it is this is just a purely business thing is that you know we're a Scottsdale bookstore so we are licensed to do business in Scottsdale and we have some freedom if we go to private venues in other parts of Metro Phoenix. But if you do an event in a government facility in another city in Metro Phoenix, such as Mesa, 
you have to go through all these hoops. You have to get a special business license. You have to do all this other stuff. And so generally we avoided it. Um, but I was so intrigued by the thought of spending any time with GNL that that I, you know, we did do that. The hardest one, strangely enough, um, are anything that is on the Pima Indian Reservation because they have an entirely different layer of complexity. So Scottsdale Community College has a great auditorium. And uh, we did an event for Jeffrey Deaver with his James Bond book that was amazing. But the complications of trying to sell books, you know, in that there's a lot you learn when you, you never think when you go into a retail business, you think it can't be that hard. <laughs> last night, it, turns last out night was... it actually is in many respects. Surprisingly yeah. difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. Last night was, I think, even despite the little glitches, I think it was one of the more uh, entertaining events. That it we was. Had. We were in what used to be a Harkins. Harkins is a fabulous movie chain. It's very, it's not one of the, you know, AMC or whatever, but we all support it here because it's locally based. Um, and they made it through the pandemic the whole bit. But um, they had an older movie theater in the big fancy mall here called Scottsdale Fashion Square. And now they build a, in the mall renovation, Harkins is a much bigger, glitzier, multi plex, you know, whatever it all is. And this little theater that they had has now been taken over by a theatrical company called Desert Stages. And it oh. holds about what, about 210 people or something. something and they like were that. actually in the middle of producing Susical, the musical, but because it was Monday night, um, they, they weren't doing Susical. So we got to use it for Preston and Child. And it was like, you know, I asked, I, I don't think I ever saw a film there, but you said you did, Patrick. Oh, you sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was there for a long time. And um, yeah, so it's like this little this little warren of, uh, of, of old movie theaters that they've yeah. retrofitted yeah. into stage theaters. And so last night, uh, Douglas Preston, it, as you were saying, it was set up for all this Dr. Seuss backdrop. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was just kind of fun, you know, different fun. different place to do it. And, do an and Lincoln, Lincoln Child had to be brought in because he wasn't there. He had to be brought in on Zoom and they had this enormous white screen behind us. So talk about bigger than life Hollywood characters. Lincoln was about 20 feet tall. Oh, I bet. Was there, you know, these <laughs> little people in front of Lincoln. It was all <laughs> gigantic <laughs> Godzilla, right? Yeah. Yeah, but no, it you know it's nice to, but it, but again, fortunately, it was in Scottsdale, so you know we didn't have to go through all the licensing and other rigmaroles to go offsite. It's also by the food court, and it has tons of free parking, so there were lots of advantages to it. It's kind well, of a, it's so just kind of a whimsical, whimsical kind of place, which is yeah. kind of kind of neat. And well, in any different venue is always refreshing and fun. It's kind of exhilarating. Well, it is. But, you know, it's it's also interesting that a lot of customers really just want to go to the bookstore. They well, they want to buy books. <laughs> well, but we have books. That isn't the issue. I think, you know, it's just like a happy place for them. They're comfortable. Yeah. And they don't always want to go and find you in a, yeah. in a new place. I, you have to often, often over the years, you have to do something several times at a new place before everybody gets used to it. Yeah, and this is probably the best off-site place that we can currently find, and it was they were wonderful to work with. They were really fun. So I'm, I imagine we'll go there again. Hotels have priced themselves out of any reasonable market. Yeah, um, yeah. It's thousands of dollars to to do something in a hotel now. It was always expensive, but never on this level. So well, I think post COVID too, you know, they're trying to recoup their losses in yeah, a way. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely true. You know, I mean, I'll, yeah, there we are. Everybody's trying to recoup. <laughs> right, everyone is. Any, any other questions, Patrick? Yeah, any any TV or movie stuff going on currently, Tracy? There is lots of TV and movie stuff going on currently. And um sort of early stages, but it's exciting because we are um, in talks right now, um, have interest from CBS and Paramount Plus um, for Monkey Wrench as a streaming series. Well, that think, was the only way to do Monkey Wrench. Absolutely. So, you know, you never know if Hollywood, if it's ever going to happen, but it's, um, things are, are quite far along. 
and I'm really excited and optimistic, and I think it would be perfect for it. So um, fingers crossed on that, and we'll just keep plugging away. If they, you know, things don't work out, there's other places to go. So hopefully that will happen soon. And then the Christmas novel, Return of the Magi, is it actually um, very far along in um, becoming an animated feature film. Wonderful. Ooh. Yeah. So, um, you know, I can't really share anything because it's, you know, early stages, but um, y'all yeah, will be the first to know when something happens because I'll be like just flying high and running around, tearing my hair out. <laughs> yeah, no, all over social. Oh, my God. Guess what? <laughs> so, oh, that's great. Well, yeah, you, you, you worked a long time and it, it would be exciting for your stories to be presented on yet a different platform. You You're know, really, it's wonderful. A dream. But it, those other platforms reach a really big audience, and then mm -hmm. they can read more books. So it's all good. Yeah, it's all good all the way around. So hopefully, hopefully. That it, Patrick? That's about it. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Well, yeah. Tracy, I'm going to call her Tracy for once, not PJ here. Well, um, yeah, interchangeable. <laughs> I know, but well, PJ is the name on the book. So, you know, yeah. I kind of thought that I would stick with that, but actually um, this is Tracy. So thank you. It was wonderful to spend time with you again. And I hope one of these days she'll come and see us. If you get so tired of Minnesota, you just want a winter break. Come R.E.M. <laughs> yep. you thank you guys. Out. It's been so great to be with you again. I always appreciate you having me. And I love to be spending time with you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Thanks, Tracy. Have a wonderful year and keep us informed about all these projects. Will you? I sure will do. Thanks, you guys. Have a great okay. night. Good night, everyone.